It is very likely that if you go to any country in the world, you will find a restaurant, and that is true in countries that even have their own tradition of dining out, as many countries do. But for some reason, the French model has been unusually influential, and the word restaurant has become nearly universal. That word was first used in conjunction with an eatery in 1767 in Paris. And many people ask a very simple question, which is: Before the restaurant, where did you go to eat? Could you go out to eat before the restaurant? What sort of food did you have if you did? Now, it's not like nobody's ever tried to answer this question. The most common answers you'll see are that people had to eat roasts in taverns, or they had to sit at a common table and just take whatever was served. You couldn't order a la carte. You couldn't order individual items. It's also been said that there were no destinations; that people didn't go to particular places just to eat. I'm going to share with you what I have found on this subject, and I'm going to start in the 13th century because that is when we start getting the most information. By the 13th century, Paris, which had been very unimportant for centuries and wasn't the capital again until the 10th century, had become fairly important. France itself was still pretty small, and so Philip Augustus felt the need to surround Paris with walls because the borders were still not very far away from the capital at that point. He began in 1190, but the walls are not finished until the 13th century. If you envision today's Paris very roughly as a target, and then imagine a bullseye on that target, that is about how big medieval Paris was relative to today's. It was very, very small, and yet it was the biggest city in Europe. And it also had cultural importance at this point because on the left bank, which is to say on the southern bank of the Seine. A university had grown up, and this meant that students from all over Europe, there were no student cafeterias. They had to find ways to eat, along with all the Parisians who might have had reasons to eat away from home. And one of their professors, an Englishman named John of Garland, actually wrote about the options in a book called the Dictionarius, which was a Latin dictionary which used examples instead of definitions. John talks about two kinds of cooks: the coqui and the coquinari. The coqui were the chefs, that is, the cooks for big households who led whole teams. And when you hear that medieval food was made with lots of spices and used big birds like peacocks, that was food prepared by the chefs of large households. All the way up to the Revolution, the most elegant cuisine was made in private households by chefs. The first Parisian chef, whose name we know, was a man named Isambard. He was Saint Louis's cook, and there were several other Isambards who worked for subsequent kings. And then, in the 14th century, you get a man who's often considered the first celebrity chef, and that was Guillaume Tirel, better known as Taillevent. Both Isambard and Taillevent became very rich because a chef was very, very important to the prestige of a large household. But then there were the coquinari, who were the cuisiniers or cooks, and in this case, public cooks. John shows them selling roast goose, which was very popular for a few hundred years, roast pigeon, roast fowl, and all this served with sauces and garlic. What he's essentially showing us here are roasters, and since wa goose was so popular, the waie were the roasters. Now the poulterers could also sell various roasts, not just poultry, but ultimately they surrendered that privilege to the waie. Then he names the pastelari. The pastelari were pastry cooks, and pastry in this period was not any sweet ornate confection. It was anything made in dough. Paste, our English word paste, and the French word paste, all meant originally dough. And things made in dough were pastisserie. Later, pâtisserie. This included pies, and so John shows the pastry cooks selling pork pies, chicken pies, eel pies, and tarts and flans for desserts. These were not sweet. Desserts would not be sweet for another two hundred years. The roasters and the pastry cooks, for centuries, were two of the most important food providers in Paris. And you could buy food in the streets from a roaster. You could get some meat, or from a pie man, you could get a little pie or a tart. But they also played other roles, as we will see. 
Inns and taverns also sold food. They sold roasts. They sold bread. They sold cheese. They sold herring. An inn, in theory, sold lodging. A tavern was literally a wine shop. You could actually go there to buy wine to take home. But the distinction was blurred because taverns often had rooms and inns often sold wine. Still, these were some of the very first public eateries in Paris. They were rough places, and one implication of that was that women of any standing, mainly noble women, but also the wives of rich merchants, for instance, did not go to public eateries, and that would be true for a very, very long time. There were also street vendors, and a poet actually wrote down the street cries in the 13th century, so we know that you could buy all kinds of produce in the streets, chervil, cabbage, cherries, pears, but you could also buy cooked food. Notably, you could buy cooked broad beans. And the broad bean from the Franks all the way up to the 18th century was probably the quintessential French food. You see it in monasteries, you see it in archaeological digs from Frankish sites, you see it in the street cries, which are largely for the most ordinary people, you see it in aristocratic households. The broad bean was often paired with another legume, which was the pea, and today we eat the green pea, which is a young pea. But for a very long time, people ate white, mature peas, which today are called field peas. And you could buy those cooked in puree in the streets of Paris, or you could buy them with big chunks of bacon, because French bacon is much thicker than American bacon. We know, too, that private dining became very luxurious in this period because the last two kings of the 13th century, Philip the Bold and Philip the Fair, passed statutes which were meant to rein in this luxury in dining. And both the statutes essentially limited people to three courses, each with only one item in each course. There were variations, but that was the essence of it. Now, the rich probably didn't follow these strictures, but this does give us some idea of what the baseline was was for a decent but not excessive meal in the 13th century. At the start of the 14th century, there are statutes for cooks. These statutes sell them selling cooked meat, salted meat, cooked fish, broad beans and peas explicitly, and sausage. The roasters made pork sausage. Blood sausage was made by another group, which raises a question that would become very important in France in the coming centuries, which was the difference between the different trades groups and their defense of their privileges, which, among other things, meant they had the right to inspect other groups, which later on they would do quite a bit. There was a poet named Eustace Deschamps who shows a fight taking place in a tavern after supper and during the tar. So what this tells us is you could have a full supper in a tavern, and you could even have dessert. There is a wonderful poem in the middle of the century about three women going on a bender. And of course, they're very working class women. They go to taverns which are around what was already the biggest market at the time, Les Halles. And today that area, the, the market is gone, but the area is still very lively. And as they go, they eat. And they have tripe, which generally was considered a low food. You see it in the lower types of taverns, but there were some aristocrats who ate it as well. Then they have roast goose, which was very common at this point, roast garlic, and gastel. Gastel would have been dessert because gastel is a word that became gâteau. But a cake in this period was not sweet. It was not complex. It was really a finer bread with maybe butter or eggs in it. Then, in another place, they have wafers and waffles. A wafer, for a very long time, was like a mini waffle. It was a little circle of dough, which was cooked between two hot irons. And for centuries, wafers were one of the most popular street foods in Paris. In the 19th century, waffles would become more popular, but waffles were already made in the 14th century, and they were thicker and often filled with cheese. Then they have cheese, and they have almonds, they have salted herring, they have pears, walnuts, and again, tripe. There are also police records in this period which show men stealing bacon from taverns. So you could buy bacon in taverns. There is one incident where a man actually went into a tavern, ordered bread, ordered cheese, then he melted the cheese in his cup and used the tip of his knife, because there were no forks, to dip the bread 
into the cheese. And this is the first recorded instance of a fondue. Now, we know how to make medieval waffles because towards the end of the 14th century, an aging knight wrote a household manual for his 15-year-old wife. And this book is called The Ménager de Paris. It's sometimes translated as The Good Man of Paris. And it includes quite a few recipes, but it also includes instructions on how to hold a wedding. And he tells his wife, first of all, to rent a space. They had a big house, but it was not unusual when you held an event to rent a separate space. And then he tells her to hire a chef. And so what we have here is the first recorded instance of catering in Paris. Now, there were several aristocratic upscale dishes in these weddings, such as blanc mange, which is, in this period, was still a mixture of chicken, almonds, rice, and sugar, nothing like the pudding we know today, and what were called jellies, which really were pieces of meat or fish under jelly. So the chef would have made these dishes, but the chef also acted as an executive producer. And his men were supposed to negotiate, and that's the word in French, marchandé, for all the other items that were used in these weddings. And that included a lot of spices, several different kinds of sauce, including cameline, which is a cinnamon-based sauce, and roasts and pies. The roast, in this case, came from the poulterers. The pies probably came from pastry cooks, so though it's not specified. Now, this pattern of having a sophisticated chef make the more complex dishes while also having roasters provide roasts and pastry cooks provide tarts and flans and pies, this would last for centuries. We know this because in 1578, a Venetian ambassador said that if you wanted to organize a feast, you could have the roasters provide the roast meat, the pastry cooks provide the pies, the torts, the starters, and the desserts, and the chefs provide the pottages and the jellies. We get to the 15th century and life was rough for Paris for a while because it was the Hundred Years' War. But things calmed down. In 1430, you see plotters meeting for breakfast at a place called the Pomme de Pain, the pine cone. And the Pomme de Pain was right in the middle of that long, narrow island. Today, there's a street there called the Rue de la Cité. Back then, it had two different names, but the Pomme de Pain was right there, which made it about as central a place as you could have in medieval Paris. And for several centuries, it had a reputation. In the 16th century, Rabelais talked about people eating fine shoulders of mutton flavored with parsley at the Pomme de Pain. And in the 17th century, there's a poem about peace, where the man says how much he prefers the fat pigs and the chickens at the Pomme de Pain to the barley bread he was eating during war. In the middle of the 15th century, the pastry cooks also got their statutes, which mainly gave them the exclusive right to make tarts and pies and flans and all the things they had been making, as well as something called a risole. A risole was ground meat inside pastry and then deep fried. So it wasn't very different from an empanada. But they were also forbidden to do something, which of course implies they'd been doing it, and that was to send men into taverns to sell little pies, darioles, which were a kind of filled medieval pastry, and at least so. So this gives us a little glimpse into what snacks were like in taverns. Meanwhile, in this period, a word had already come down from the Flemish country, which meant little room, and that word was cabaret, and in French that became cabaret. A cabaret was not really very different from a tavern. They were both considered wine shops. They both sold food. And yet, for some reason, very early on, a cabaret was considered superior to a tavern. And it was said that people who would not go to a tavern would go to a cabaret. Both apparently cheated their customers because in 1519, François Premier issued a statute addressed to inns, taverns, and cabarets. So we know that those were the main meal providers in Paris at that point, and he instructs local officials to set prices for a list of items which are most likely to be sold in these places. And that list is white, brown, and black bread, which is to say from the best to the worst quality of bread, wine by the pint in every color, and there are a number of colors of wine at this point, beef, mutton, veal by the pound or the size of the piece, depending on the area, kid, lamb, capon, hen, chicken, hare, 
rabbit, partridge, snipe, or other birds commonly sold in these places, cheese, bacon. Now, up to then, the list of items is very much what you might expect in a tavern, and mainly foods that you could roast in the fireplace. But then the list goes on. Oil, vinegar, verjuice, which was a kind of tart grape juice, mustard by measure, sugar and other spices by the pound. Now, this shows us that sugar, which was considered a spice for a long time, had become cheap enough to be sold more publicly, but also that you could get spices in in taverns and cabarets. Salted and fresh fish, legumes, greens, and other required and necessary things. So what this list shows us is that you could get a complete meal in any one of these places. Now, the cheaper places probably had a much more limited range of products, but certainly for any place that was at all luxurious, you could get a full meal. The statute also says to set prices for napkins and tablecloths, and this is the first mention we have of a cover charge. The cover charge would be mentioned very rarely going through the subsequent centuries. Even into the 19th century, you only see it mentioned from time to time. That certainly doesn't mean it was never charged, but we just don't have any record of it until the start of the 20th century when Parisian menus most often had a little entry for cuvier, which is a small amount which you paid for your napkin and your tablecloth. And that was true up until the 60s when the cover charge was banned. The next statute of this sort was in 1532. And the big difference in this statute was that it also said that people coming to these places should find all the prices written on a sign, which is to say a menu. And this is the first mention of a menu. Now, we don't know for sure that all of these places obeyed. It does show that the idea of a menu already existed. Charles IX issued a statute that was very like those from François Premier, but he also did what the 13th century kings had done, which is he tried to define a good but not excessive meal. And again, he talks about three different courses, but this time he says you can have six items for each course. And you would think that six items for each course would make for a pretty substantial meal, but in fact, we know that this was not followed because about 11 years later, a man named Baudin wrote about luxury and the economy in general. And he said, one is not content in an ordinary dinner with three ordinary services. First of the boiled, then of the roast, and third of the dessert. What is more, meat must be made in five or six ways, using so many hashes, sauces, pastries, all sorts of salmagundis and mishmashes, so that it becomes a great waste. Whereas, if old frugality had continued, one would see on the table at a feast only five or six sorts of meat, one of each type, and prepared naturally without putting in all these new delicacies. There would be less waste and food would still be cheaper. But everyone today wants to have feasts, and a feast is not properly done if there is not an infinity of sophisticated foods there to sharpen the appetite and irritate the spirit. Everyone today wants to go to the Moor, Sanson, Innocent, and Havar. And so here we are, almost in the last quarter of the 16th century, and we see Parisians doing essentially what Parisians do today, going to select places, in our terms, trendy places, being willing to pay dearly for a good meal, and expecting sophisticated, complicated foods, not just wanting boiled or roast meats, really wanting very carefully prepared dishes. Now let me take a moment to talk about how food was priced, because we've already seen that for much of the period, the standard was a la carte pricing, that's what the statute said. And then Lipomano, the Venetian ambassador, says there are cabarets which will feed you at their places for every price. For a testoon, for two, for a crown, for four, for ten, for twenty. Up to that point, it sounds like he's talking about what you would pay as an individual to eat in one of these places. But then he goes on to say, even per person, if you wish. The French phrase is by the head. And we realize that all those other prices are literally to pay for the dinner or the supper, which makes sense if you consider that a lot of people used cabarets as their dining rooms. And so you'd invite your friends out and you pay for the whole meal. But clearly not everybody wanted to do that all the time. 
And so you have this practice which now appears of charging by the head. And that is the reference you will see going forward, especially as almanacs and guidebooks appear and they list places to eat. But it doesn't end with the restaurant. You still see references to the price by the head well after the restaurant. And it just seems to have been a way to say this is a set price or this is the range of price for a meal at this particular place. Now, today in Paris, you have what are called tourist menus where you pay a set price and you get a starter and then a main dish and dessert. And some of these were like that. There are actually advertisements that show that was exactly what you got for the price per head. But we also have evidence that people were still ordering individual items and paying for them, as you will see. Now let's go back to the Moors, which is the first of the places that Baudin names. The moor was the little moor, le petit moor, and there may have been several of them. One certainly was in the Rue de Seine, because if you go to the Rue de Seine today, you'll still see a medallion that says le petit moor, and that medallion existed in the 18th century. In the 16th and 17th century, this area was still outside the city walls, as a lot of eateries were. It's possible that another petit moor had originally been inside the walls, and then there was certainly one in Vaugirard, which was a little town outside Paris. Today, it's part of the 15th century. So, when the essayist Montaigne went to Italy, he said that there is a certain cabaret in Tuscany where the local nobility went, as they do to the Moors in Paris. One person who went to the Moors in Paris was Henry IV, and he and his friends were charged three crowns a head, and he made his friends pay for themselves. A few years later, there was a man who went with friends and was charged six crowns a head, and he paid for everybody, and then dropped dead that night. Later in the 17th century, somebody said that if you wanted to hold a feast, you didn't have to bother yourself, you could just negotiate with a little more. And all the way up to the 18th century, there was a man who had breakfast there. His breakfast was a pint of white wine and a bunch of radishes. Meanwhile, we're almost out of the 16th century. It's 1599. And Henry IV gives statutes to a new trades group, a corporation. And this trades group was made up of the chefs, who had been catering for a while, of the cooks, who were essentially line cooks at this point, and a group called the Pelt Shop. Now, there are many definitions of Pelt Shop, but in this case, it seems to mean the people who provided the tablecloth and the napkins and other necessary items. Right out of the box, this new corporation gets the right to host weddings and big banquets. So it takes a number of rights away from the cabarets and taverns. Since to invite somebody or feed them was to treat them, traiter, the group that did this became known over time as the treaters, the traiteurs, and that was the name used for this group going forward starting a few decades into the 17th century. And they would become very important. In fact, this is the beginning of the downfall of taverns and cabarets, but it would take some time. At the start of the 17th century, cabarets were still some of the finest places to eat, and some of them were run by women. One near the Louvre was run by a woman named La Boisselière, and somebody put La Boisselière as a character in a play, and you see her trying to collect a bill from a man and his lackey. She doesn't say you had supper for so much per head or dinner for so much per head. She enumerates the items she served them each day through the week. And that was a half pheasant, soup from the pot, new peas, that is the green peas we're used to today, but which were a big luxury at the time, turnip soup, a cooked pear for dessert, a shoulder with a leg, presumably of lamb, the roast or boiled beef, good wine, white bread, a white tablecloth, good fresh eggs, broad beans, fresh sea fish, salad, capers, chicory, mutton or salted beef. And she says that all this could add up to 200 pounds. So we see a cabaret owner enumerating the specific foods are ordered and adding up the prices of all these items. Another woman was called La Durier. There's all kinds of colorful stories about La Durier. And her cabaret was out in the suburbs in a place called saint Cloud. One of the stories about La Durier is that she opened a little garden next to her cabaret so honest women, as they said at the time, 
could come and taste her food and drink her wine without, God forbid, going into her cabaret. Now, this shows that women still did not go into places, even when they were very well known, as Adelier's cabaret was, but also they were curious enough to go out to saint Clou and sit in this garden and have her offerings. Another story about Adelier shows her lending money to an aristocrat who was down on his luck, and then when he tried to pay her back, she kept refusing. He kept insisting. And finally, she said, look, if you want to pay me, give me two pistoles. So he gave her two Spanish crowns, which is what pistoles were. And she immediately turned to her people and said, here, this is what monsieur gives you. And that is one of the first mentions we have of a tip for food service. Now, we know that people were tipped for other things starting at least in the 15th century, probably before, but it's very rare to see mentions of tips for food service. There's one maybe a hundred years before this that might be proof of that, but certainly by this point, people of a certain rank only were tipping for their food, and this is the first mention we have of it. Cabarets at this point were paying an extra tax called an eighth for the right to serve food, and taverns for some reason were not, and of course the cabarets didn't appreciate this, and so in 1640 a law restricted taverns to selling wine par huit coupés et peau renversée, which is to say by a cut door and an overturned pot. The sense of this basically is that they had become wine shops again. That They could only sell wine through an opening in the door, pour it out into the customer's receptacle, and then show that they had turned over their own receptacle. If they served the wine right there, they were considered to be a cabaret and had to pay the eighth. Now, the statute doesn't say a word about food, but in practice, this would have prevented the taverns from offering food. There's some evidence that some did, but it was enough of an obstacle to them that in 1680, they protested that they were no threat to the cabarets because only the little people went to the taverns and they got the right to have tablecloths and napkins and serve meat. But just serving meat was a big step down from where they had been before. Meanwhile, the traiteurs were becoming more and more aggressive and raiding places. In 1662, they raided a cabaret and found the men serving veal breast with beati, which is a rich, complex sauce, eight pigeons, and chicken a la daube. Now, right off, this shows us that cabarets were selling some pretty complex food in the 17th century, but they thought it was too complex for anybody but a traiteur to be offering, and they confiscated all the food and all the equipment. And then the following year, Louis XIV gave the traiteur the right to anything to do with their craft, and their craft was cooking, whereas the taverns and cabarets were theoretically wine merchants. Strangely, somewhat after that, the man who had been raided sued them, and he won. And they had to pay for all the food they took and restore all his equipment. Why is not clear, but it does show how hard it was sometimes to distinguish what was food that was too ornate for anybody but a traiteur to make. The French word goût means taste, and to dégoûter is to disgust, to drive away taste, but there's also its opposite, which is to ragoûter, to stimulate taste, to stimulate appetite. And so you have this word which appears in this period, ragu, which now means a stew, but initially meant any dish prepared to stimulate appetite. And the traiteur demanded the right to make all ragu and fricassees and they would raid other businesses to be sure they were not doing anything similar. Meanwhile, at the end of the 16th century, inns had begun to serve the people staying there meals, where you would pay a set price and then eat at a common table. It does not seem to be until the end of the 17th century that they opened these to anybody who could pay, and so you could go to an inn and pay a set price and just eat whatever was served. These were originally called inns tables, they ended up being called host tables, table d'hôte. And not only did the traiteur not try to stop them, but in fact a lot of traiteurs began to offer their own table d'hôte. And this did indeed become the most common model for public eating in Paris. It was not the only one, as we'll see, but it was very, very common. There were also places called gargotes, which were basically just dives, just very cheap taverns where you could get a very cheap meal, and it was understood that it wouldn't be a good meal, but for some people it was the best they could do. Now let's talk about a social aspect 
of eateries, which is seduction. And even today, it's not unusual if you have an interest in someone else to take them out to dinner with expectations of varying sorts afterwards. This was probably already true in previous times, but the first clear evidence of it appears in the 17th century. And so you have a man inviting a young woman to a place called La Mise, which was a real place. And she says, you mistake yourself, Chevalier, a girl of my quality at a cabaret. And he replies, oh, if you please, La Mise is not a cabaret. It is a famous traiteur. Because it was already said at this point, people who would not go to a cabaret would go to a traiteur's. And there's also a play where you see a man who's trained to get somewhere with a young woman, and he tells his valet to go to the nearest cabaret and get three dishes, and the valet says, three dishes of what? So he says, okay, three dishes of roast, a young turkey, two fine young hares, and a chicken, as well as some salad, and their best wine. Now note that he says exactly what he wants. He doesn't say, get me whatever they have for three crowns. He puts in an order for specific dishes. There's also a poem from 1680 with the delightful title of A Cabaret Waiter with a Plate Being Thrown at His Head. And in the middle of the poem, the speaker says, here's your money, count it up, 30 for capon, 6 for bread, 2 for cheese, 16 for wine, 10 for ham, is that right? Plus five souls for the cover and two souls for you, so you will remember me. And so what you see here is basically a modern restaurant check in a poem. You've got the price of each item listed. He's telling the waiter to add it up, just as you might today. And he even tells us how much he tips. So we get to the 18th century, and there's another court case between a cabaret and a traiteur. And the outcome of this is that cabarets could only serve grilled or roasted meat. They could not have a cook. They could not have a display of meat, because apparently these places actually put their meat up so people could see what they had to offer. And now taverns and cabarets cabarets had been driven way down from where they'd been in the 16th century to basically selling roast or grilled meats. In the same period, you begin to get special cabarets outside Paris, which were largely working class dance halls, and they were called ganguette. Several were in an area, if you think of Paris as a clock, it was towards 10 o'clock, it was called La Courtie. The most famous was run by a man named Rampano, and there are several woodcuts of Rampano's place. But another was called Les Porcherons, and a man who ate at the Porcheron recorded his meal there, which was terrine of beef a la mode, cabbage soup, onion soup, shoulder of lamb with shallot, leg of lamb with garlic, capon with crest, scabwort pie, cakes, and salads. So, a fairly varied meal. Now, there are other descriptions of food at Ganguette, which are far less appetizing. You get to 1761, which is very close to the restaurant, and there's a play where we see a traiteur trying to collect a bill, and again, he enumerates what he has brought. For an eight-pound short rib, ten francs. For two wild rabbits, four pounds, ten soles. For twelve ortolans, eighteen pounds. For a partridge pie, the ingredients in the making, a louis. For a leg of lamb, six francs. A hundred soles for the dessert. So we get up to 1767, and a dictionary says that a traiteur is an artisan who, in a way, has taken to himself the rights of the pastry cook, the roaster, and the cabaret keep. And that was true. The traiteurs, by the middle of the 18th century, had pretty much taken over all the good food service. Now, you could eat very well at a traiteur, as we've seen, but they were the ones who had the best food and could prevent others from serving the best food. Meanwhile, there was a kind of health fad where people began to worry about weak chest. A weak chest was a very vague condition. It wasn't, as you might think, tuberculosis or something of that sort. It's just a general weakness. And the cure for a weak chest was said to be a special bullion made by distilling the juices of various meats into something called a restaurant. And a restaurant was fairly complicated to make. So in 1767, a man named Matheran Rose de Chamoiseau had the idea of opening a sort of cafe for restaurants on the Rue des Poulies, which today is the beginning of the Rue du Louvre. And he did serve restaurants, and his ad goes on at some length about how much easier it is to buy them at his place than make them at home. But he also sold gruels and macaroni, of all things, and even capon with coarse salt. 
So there's a little bit of solid food here. Still, basically, he was not a traiteur. He was a restorer, a restaurateur. And these restorers, restaurateur, became very popular because people imitated his first place very quickly. And soon you had this idea of restaurateur competing with the traiteur. What's more, a lot of traiteur took on the name restaurateur. And the next thing you know, Paris was filled with traiteur, restaurateur. And that brings us to the restaurant, which is a whole separate story and the end of this one. If you would like to know more about this subject, please see the relevant chapter in my book, A History of the Food of Paris, From Roast Mammoth to Steak Fleet.